We're glad you're here. Those that are joining us by Facebook this morning, I just want to say uh, thank you for joining us. And, uh, you know, there's several people that um, aren't here today. Some of them, Pastor Ramey and uh, his wife, uh, Barb, are on their way home. They should be here this evening. They took a little road, road trip with uh, Claudia and Sherman. So uh, I think they're, you said some time this evening. So I don't know where they really are, but just keep them in your prayers. And uh, we're looking forward to having him back. Sister Sandy's leg has uh, been bothering her, so we want to keep her in our prayers. That's why she's not here. My wife had to go pick up our other daughter at the airport today, so that's why she's not here. And several people aren't here for different reasons, but we're glad you're here. And uh, just, I just feel God's going to move in a special way here today. I want to thank you for just uh, just coming and sharing your heart today. We want the Lord to move. We're praying that God will just touch Caleb and Pastor Joe's going to be sharing a little bit with us, the word of the Lord. So, uh, again, if you want to just go with me in a prayer right now, I just want the Lord's presence to be rich and real here. Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for your presence that we feel. And Lord, I ask right now that you would move, Lord, on behalf of every person that is listening today, whether they're in this sanctuary or they're listening by Facebook. Father, a lot of people are not feeling well, sick. Lord, not just with the COVID, but different things, Lord. And I pray right now that your hand, Lord, and that they would raise up their hand and agree with me that in Jesus' name, you would touch them and let them be well, Lord. My daughter, Nicole, so many, Lord, that just need your touch today, Lord. And we just give them to you, Lord. All that we would do here today, we want you to be glorified, magnified, and lifted up in this house, in the worship service, and in the word that we be shared today. Lord, we want to give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name.
Chris asked me to sing that song this morning, and I said, sure, buddy, I can do whatever you want me to do. Um, I was just in Texas last week, and it was very um, interesting. <laughs> Texans don't know how to handle snow, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but I know God's hand was upon me because I actually have to stay in hotels with water and heat. Some guys that I was with that traveled with me had to sleep in their cars and didn't have food or shower for three days. Um, so it's just amazing to what the little things that he does, you know. These little things come back to me like when my grandma used to tell me, son, never stop singing your hymns. So Mamma Ramy, this is for you this morning. Yeah. 
we worship you. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We magnify you. Hallelujah. I feel his presence here this morning. I feel his spirit. And I think we're done with the worship here right now. We got another song, Kim? Got another song. Okay. One more song, I think, and then Pastor Joe's going to come up and share the word with us this morning. I, uh, I'm just thankful that uh, my name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. 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 That Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That uh, He's not a respectful person. He loves each and every one of us. He cares for each and every one of us. We've made salvation so complicated. There's so many rules and regulations. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. So thankful that he's always given us an open invitation to invite us into his table. This song's called Yearn. Um, I used to play it with my friends back in probably high school. My brother Joe was up here yesterday. Get together on the 13th. I don't know if you guys heard about that or not. Um, us and the Hill family are going to come in on the 13th and do a family worship time. So I ask you guys all to come. It's at 5 o'clock, so that'd be great. But we started singing this song yesterday, and it brought me back to all those good times that we used to have up on stage, just singing and worshiping. And, and I want to yearn for my Lord and Jesus. Amen. Our Savior. Amen. Amen. Just listen to the words.
Joel's going to share the word with us this morning. That was a beautiful, powerful song. Praise the Lord. You bless the Lord and give him praise. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I need a little bit of One moment, please. <laughs> well, I guess I could do that. So, everyone, I know that the only you watch when I preach is because of my great jokes. <laughs> so, I have several again to make you happy. But first, but first, I want to I just want to say the talents of the Ramies and the Savoys. I swear to God, I keep saying this, and I've been saying it for years. They can rub two sticks together and sound like an orchestra, and they can sing. And I mean, they've had multiple ringies on the drums, in and out. Uh, I can't even carry a beat, a depth of that tune, according to the ringy, all the ringies. Anyway, uh, I do appreciate them greatly. And uh, bringing us into hopefully one mind and one chord, I mean, that's the important part. What we're seeking, what we're feeling, what we're, 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 we're going after. And, 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 and wanting the Holy Spirit to rush and usher us into His presence so we can receive a message. Um, I just want to pray before I, start, I go into my wonderful jokes. I know that's what you're waiting for, but so let me pray first. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for everything you do in our lives. I feel that we should start off our day and end our day with appreciation for all that you do in our lives, Father God. You give us the things we need throughout each and every day, and I don't think we recognize those things the way we should. I pray, Father God, that we start to recognize that everything we've went through in our lives before and since we've known you and accepted you as our Savior, Father God, that you knew about and that you're a part of and that you did it for our own good and for our own testimony. I pray, Father God, that you're with me through the service and what I have to share that it can move people and, the, and, and, the, and, and, and they can see you in a different way, in a more loving way. And they want to run to you, Father God, safe or unsafe. And I pray this, Father God, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so, now it's time for jokes. How long did Cain hate his brother? Anyone? How long did Cain hate his brother? Anyone? As long as he was able. All right, all right. Who was the smartest man in the Bible? Solomon. He was the wisest. Solomon was the wisest. Abraham, because he knew a lot. He knew oh. a lot. His cousin. All right. <laughs> That's the end of God. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to start out with Jeremiah 1 5. It says, and I want, this is the theme I want. I want, I want throughout the entire message, which is that how God knew us before the foundation of the world. And that maybe, because what God has for me to share is, is pretty, it's a pretty dark part of my life this week. Um, and I, I know I keep saying this, that I think our testimonies are really powerful. And it's the testimony of the blood of the Lamb that, that defeats our enemies. And sometimes I think that we need to hear these things that people go through in pastors. And, and especially pastors, because we think of them, you think of a pastor that they've never done anything wrong, and you know, they, they, they've always had a great walk with God, and everything's been holy and jolly and whatever, and it's just not the case. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say how other people preach or if they don't preach about the dark parts of their life or not. I'm just knowing this is what I'm compelled to do. Um, but it says, Jeremiah 1 5, it says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So I don't really know how to start this story uh, that I'm going to share. I'm going to start it this way. It was 29 years ago this weekend that my, at the time, one of my best friend and I had left my apartment and climbed to hit his car with our ski mask and some homemade weapons because we were going to go 
and trying to kill somebody. But then when we did that, we got into his car and he had a, this was 1992, he had an 87 Escort that was in perfect shape, only had like 40,000 miles on it. He wouldn't have started, the car wouldn't start. It wouldn't even turn over. And it, you know, we tried, we tried, we tried, we finally just went back upstairs and kept on drinking the rest of the beer we had. But we had, we had decided to so do that. Now you're probably wondering why this, I'm starting out this way and what this even means. So I'll back up even more before that. Um, on January 20th, 1992, I was living in Ace Motel, Room 21, in Melville, Michigan. Um, my, well, she was my girlfriend at the time, my ex-wife and I, went down to, to spend time with the, uh, the manager of the motel. And he had befriended us, and he was an Indian guy, and he was the first time I ever met an Indian guy, and we were going down there and have some, have some drinks and have some dinner and, and just hang out. <coughs> well, he wasn't there. We started arguing on the way back. Um, we had five bucks to our name, and how we were gonna spend that five bucks. We started arguing on the way back. We get back to our room, and not even three minutes later, the Melvin Police show up to our, our, our room. Because we had moved from room 14 to room 21, which room 21 at Ace Motel was the place because you had your own driveway. So, and it, it kind of like had a divider in the room where he almost had like a, like a bedroom. It almost felt like a mini apartment. So they show up, and my ex-wife at the time was just irate, um, mostly me, but the, the police do were there. And uh, wants our IDs, so we give our IDs, and go back and forth for like 20 minutes. She's inside the room. I'm outside with the police, and there's like two doors and a wall, probably about that wide between us. And the police had said, if we, we have more, if we had to come back here, there's gonna be a problem. I'm like, listen, man, I, I have every right in the world to argue with my girlfriend. I'm not disturbing anybody's peace. If, we have, I, if you had to come back, I, I guess we'll have a problem. Well, they didn't like that at all. And they proceeded to uh, throw me against the wall, handcuff me, threw me on the ground. And then um, one officer hog tied me, so now I'm hog tied together. And then sat on me while the other officer, I had long hair then, proceeded to take my, me by the back of my head by pulling my hair and beating my face in the ground for about three or four minutes until I broke my teeth out. But then they, they, they joined me after I said, hey, can you stop now? I, you know, my teeth are gone. I don't know what else you want from me. They drove me to the car. And I'm in the car. And they're trying to talk me. From there to the police station was probably three or four minute drive, I don't know. To try to talk me into saying that it was all my fault. I'm like, I, what did I do? I wasn't my fault, I'm just bleeding all over the place. And so we get to the police station, they got this little this this garage door that raised up, they drove inside, the door shut behind me, and I don't know what's gonna happen next. I don't know, I I, I don't even know what's going on. And um they open us to the door to the place, and they open the door of the car. They grab me by my, my hands, and they, I'm bleeding. They drug me forward. I'm bleeding. They drug me through my blood, up these steps, into this room. This, I don't know what size the room was. It's, I don't know. It was, like, it was like a 20 by 20 room. It was huge. And uh, there was like 15 police officers in there. And, they had, and then the one side of the room was a sink. They dragged me over to the sink take my neck and push it over the sink so I can bleed in the sink. And they're trying to decide what they're gonna do with me. I had never ever, in, until that moment, thought that I could possibly die. But I thought that was the moment I was gonna die. So they, they finally, the, the, they were, and they were talking about doing some stuff. And the final, the, the officer in charge, whoever he was, I don't know, lieutenant, whatever, um, it was about 6.30 to 7 o'clock at night. Comes in, comes in the room and says, you gotta take him to the hospital. So the ambulance shows up, they drag me again, face first, to the ambulance, into the hospital. I sat in uh, Oakwood's waiting room, ER room, handcuffed in the bed with a gurney on him for seven hours. At 11 o'clock, with shift change, 
And uh, they're, the, the police were trying to stay for overtime and they're going back and forth on the radio and they didn't want to pay the overtime because I wasn't being violent. And they released me on a personal bond. And they finally took me out of, they finally took me out of the handcuffs where I was chained to the bed. And uh, I finally went and looked in the mirror. My teeth were missing and there was blood all over my face, black eyes, part of my hair was gone. I couldn't believe what had happened. And for those hours, <clears throat> everyone, people came in before me and people came in after me, got treated and then let go, treated and released. They just kept me in that bed. They didn't, they didn't treat me. Turns out, I go into, I go into the, uh, finally see the, the ER doctor. And the ER, ER doctor said that the police had told them not to treat me, make me sit there and wait. Well, they had gotten my teeth and uh, they had to wrap it up in some sort of water, paper, uh, paper towel, and something, I don't know. But by that point, my, the, the roots had died so they couldn't replace them because I had sat there for seven hours. So I'm, I'm telling you all this because I want you to understand it, there are things that happen to people that shouldn't happen to people. There are things that happen to people that make them give up on God. And, and, and I'm telling you this because this is my own personal struggle. I don't know if anybody else has had these struggles. But I'm telling you, before this moment, before this moment in time, I still believe there was a God. And then the next day, and so I finally get out of the hospital, whatever, this is the way it is, this is what it's going to be, okay, whatever. So I finally get out of the hospital. Um, the next day I call my parents and tell them what happened, and they told me it was probably my fault, and my dad said that they probably should kill me. So that was my family support. That's what I had. And I didn't bother calling anybody else in my family because I figured if my parents feel that way, I'm sure everybody else feels the same way, and I don't know. But I didn't believe in God. As a matter of fact, I, at that point in time, I started hating people. I started hating people because I had done nothing to anybody. I wasn't a drug dealer. I wasn't, I wasn't out, even though I was in a motel, I'd lost my job. I got thrown out of the place I was living. My parents, nobody in my family let me move in with them. Uh, my friends didn't, they didn't have room. I had to move to a motel room. That's where I was living. Wasn't anything I was happy about, but I had a place. And I got fired from my job. I was working at Little Cedars. And I got fired from my job, and this is, this is where I was at. So I'm moving forward now to the part of the motel uh, when I was telling you. So that was January. We got my taxes done. We finally got to rent an apartment above Langley's. And then my, my, best, my best friend at the time, I told him about it. And I, my heart a month later was so filled with hate for these people that did this to me. Turns out, and this is, this is the, this is the irony of the whole thing. It turns out that the officer that actually had done that to me, not the one sitting on me, but the other one, was a preacher in a church in Melvindale. So I don't know, I don't know what what his mindset was. I, I don't know. And this is not a charge against preachers or pastors. It's the same for human. And I can tell you at Ace Motel, and I don't know what it's called now, was not a good hotel or motel. It was not full of good people. There was not full of people that were law-abiding citizens. They were not. They just, so I'm sure the mindset there was were already messed up to begin with. Um, it was on it's on Rob Road in Shaper, which I don't know if you know that area, but it's not a pretty place to live. This is not. So my my best friend, we're, we're talking about it. He came over a couple of times. We drank a couple of times, and then um, he came over that that one night. And we had, he, we had bought the ski mask, and we're watching Saturday Night Live, and drinking, and we had our bats, and we're putting nails in the bats. We're putting nails in the bats, and I'm telling him, I'm like, dude, we don't have to do this. I said, this is my fight. I said, you know, if we don't do this, it's a felony at least. 
I said, we might get killed. I said, this guy's a cop, he's got a gun. He said, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. This is wrong, it, should, it shouldn't happen, okay? So now it's two o'clock in the morning. We go downstairs, start his car, doesn't start. God knew from the foundation of the world the things I was going to go through. And, and, the, and the reason I'm saying this is because God is a God of mercy, even when we don't know it. Amen. So I'm sure I got beat. I shouldn't have gotten beat. Whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is the moment where I was going to destroy my own life and he was going to destroy his life, God interceded because he had a plan. I'm going to read up. And I'll get back to the story. But I'm going to read Acts 22, um, 1 through 23, because I don't know if you knew this or not, but Paul was pretty much a murderer before he became Paul. Right. He was a murderer as a Saul. And starting in Acts 22, in verse 1, um, he, but he did what he did because he thought he was doing the right thing for God. It doesn't matter. He was still, he was still a murderer. And he knew that. It says, brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me as I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. Then Paul said, in verse 3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Sicilia, and I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As a student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all of you today. And I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of elders can testify <coughs> that this is so. For I received letters from them to, uh, to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authorizing me to bring the followers of the way from the, uh, there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. As I, as I was on the road, Approaching Damascus about noon, um, a very light, a very bright light from heaven suddenly showed down around me. I fell on the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus of Nazarene, the one you are persecuting. The people with me uh, saw the light but didn't understand the voice speaking with me. I asked, What should I do, Lord? The Lord told me, go up, get up and go to Damascus, and there will be, and there will be told everything you are to do. I was blinded by an intense light and had to had to be led by the hand of Damascus to my companions. A man named Ananias lived there. He was a godly man, deeply devoted to the law, a well regarded, and well regarded by the Jews of Damascus. He came and stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, we came to your sight, and that very moment I could see him. Then he told me, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear him speak. For you are his, you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have heard and seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Every sins be washed away by calling on the name of the Lord. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry. Leave Jerusalem for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I have risen and beat those who believe in you. And I was completely in agreement when your witness is Stephen, when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and held and kept the coats they took off when he was stoned. But the Lord said to me, Go, for I will send you away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened until Paul said that word. Then they all began to shout, away with such a fellow. He isn't fit to live. They yelled, throw off their coats and toss handfuls of dust in the air. And the story goes on. But the point is, he was a killer. And he was in prison. He imprisoned Christians. He did things that I never I, I never did. But in my heart, on that night, I was a murderer. I wanted to kill that man. I didn't care if his family was there. I didn't care about any of that. And apparently my friend did too. God knew from the foundation of the world who I would be and what I would go through. He put together that plan. He put together that so it would humble me and, he, and, and, and humiliate me. I needed to be humiliated. 
I need to have that memory. It's good for me. I wish I never would have went through it, but it's been good for me. Why? Because it's changed now that I am a Christian. It's changed who I am. That I can identify and empathize with people that most, some or most can't. I can now see that it was for my good for that reason. But the second reason is it gives me a powerful testimony that the devil can't take. It gives me something I can share with people that can hopefully change their lives if they just listen to the real. See, when I, I used to love going to, to the prison with you know, Pastor Chris and, and Tim and Pastor Ron, and, I mean, all, there's tons of people I went at one time, but uh, I used to love going to the prison. That's where I should have been. That's where I should have been in my heart. In my, in my opinion, uh, since the stuff, moment that car didn't start, I should have been dead or in prison. I've been a borrowed time since then. And what I mean by borrowed time is, is I shouldn't be here. God has blessed me tremendously. I, I Years later, I mean many years later, I, I, I just hated people so much. But I got saved. And when I got saved, I was listening to um, David Wilkerson. And he wasn't talking about being saved. It was just, I just felt fine with it. See, now, I don't know if you remember this before you got saved, but there's encounters. There's brushes with the Holy Spirit. There's miracles you see, and you're like, hey, that's a miracle. Somebody in my family got healed that shouldn't have been healed or whatever. This is before you knew who God is. You get these brushes with God. I had those brushes with God. God was talking to me the whole time. I had brushes with him. I didn't have an encounter until that moment. Because I was at the place, again, now I'm, 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 uh, I'm 33 years old then. At the time I was 19, so 14 years later, my hate had grown so much. I was ready to kill people still. I was a ticking time bomb. I wanted, I wanted to kill people, kill myself, or get saved, I guess. <laughs> and I didn't know that part. And I'm listening to David Wilkerson. And then suddenly it just came over me. See, I, I want to understand the encounter of God, man. That's something so powerful. The moment you got saved, I can remember every second of it still to this day. Just like I remember every second when that stuff happened outside that motel room. I remember every second where God had an encounter with me and I got saved. And I ran out of that, my, my, I had a, um, an office. I ran out of there, through my living room, through my kitchen, to my bedroom, and fell down on the floor. And I just felt the presence of God so strong that I couldn't even lift my head. And I'm crying. They'll forgive me of my sins. They'll forgive me of my wrongdoings. And I'm crying that he'll be my God. I'm crying that I'll finally feel love for the first time in my life like I've never felt before. And he did. He took a 10 million pound weight off my shoulder. I could swear to God I was flying. All this pain, all this, all this anger, and all this burdens, all this stuff was gone. It was replaced with love. It was replaced with forgiveness, true forgiveness. I've never been forgiven. Forgiven for anything. And I didn't know I needed to be forgiven, but when I was there, it was tremendous. And I was just crying out to God to restore my family and to give me my son. Because at that point, my son was, uh, son was seven or eight years old. And he was with my ex, and she was on drugs, and I didn't know how to get custody of my, of my son. I had no idea. I just didn't want him in, involved in living like that anymore. I had no idea how to do it because I'm working at, at this place where I'm, I'm swinging ships, and I don't have a wife, and I don't have any family. And then a month later, my, my, my family is completely restored to me. And a month after that, I have custody of my son. And, and they, my parents moved here to help me take care of my son. This is how good God was in just that short period of time. Everything I needed was given to me. No matter how much I wanted to kill those people that night. No matter what I went through in my life. No matter how many times I wronged people. No matter how many times I had hurt people and did it intentionally. And sometimes took joy in it. No matter how many times I I went through been living, sleeping in cars or in a field or begging for food. How many times, how many years I lived in a motel room. None of that mattered. No matter how many crimes I committed and never got caught. He still has mercy on me. And it's completely, totally undeserved. We need our stories, our testimony of the stuff that happened since and before we are saved. To show how powerful God is. 
And this is his everyday thing. This is who he is. But it's everything to me. And we're reminded of that, like Caleb's song this morning about yearning for him. That yearning comes yes. on its own. Yes. Paul. Paul's a murderer. Moses, who wrote a great deal of the Old Testament, was a murderer. David was a murderer. These guys, he took and changed them. Amen. It changed to be one of the most powerful people in the Bible. Amen. I don't care where you're at. I don't care where you're at Facebook if you're stuck on drugs. If you feel like a murderer, if you've even been a murderer, he can change everything. Amen. He can make you from what you were as a worthless pile of garbage, how you see yourself, undeserving of anything, and turning you into a mighty man of God, giving him glory. Amen. 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 Because as Paul said, in my sufferings and in my weaknesses, that's where I find his strength and give him glory. He doesn't he never bragged or boasted about the things that were good in his life. He bragged and boasted about the things he got to go through to suffer for Christ. Because yeah. he never forgot he was a murderer. He never forgot the road, that moment in Damascus. He never forgot that. No. It's powerful. Yeah. It's powerful. Your testimony is powerful. The things you went through are powerful. The losses you've had in your family and your friends are powerful. If you've been in prison, that's powerful. If, you, if you've been homeless, that's powerful. That's right. If you've been divorced, that's powerful. That's right. If you have sick children you take care of, that's powerful. That's powerful. It's a testimony. And it shows glory to God because he still has mercy. Amen. 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 I'm going to read 2 Corinthians uh, 1, verses 3 to 11. I know I'm choppy. I just go from one spot to another. Just fine. But it starts out, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of our comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Amen. When they were in our trouble, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Amen. Even though we are weighed down by our troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you then we, you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that you that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the, the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. This is Paul talking about his sufferings. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves <laughs> and learned to rely on God. Who raised the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger. And he will rescue us again. We have a place of, we have placed our confidence in him and as in he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us that, um, that many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. God has keeps showing us in the New Testament over and over again that our sufferings aren't because he doesn't love us or doesn't like us. It's for our own good. And it's for the ability to, to, to bless and comfort others. Because he's there in our weaknesses. He's there. I don't think we talk about... I mean, I see a lot of stuff on, on, on online and on TV. and You know, you know God is going to bless you. and He wants to bring you out of this. If you just donate that, you get this. It's just not how God is. It raised the just and the unjust alike. The stuff you went through, as painful as it's been, God knew. Right. And he made a plan. And it was for your own good. Right. And mostly because it's good for the people around you. Because you can say, I went through that. You can pray with people. He gives you the ability to, to do stuff in people's lives that nobody else can do because of what you went through. Amen. It makes you special. Amen. It makes you special. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, the problem of pain, it says we, we can ignore even, even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And C.S. Lewis, I mean, he's a lot better than me, and it comes already. But it's true. It's our pain. And I don't know, sometimes I'm in so much pain, and my own 
mind that I can't hear God. But sometimes I'm going through stuff, man, and I hear God shouting. I hear God shouting. Yes. Because if I could just get one second with him one day, just a day, just, just a second, just a glimpse, a whisper, I can do anything. Right. Just a whisper. Right. Sometimes it's just when I talk to other people, I talk to Pastor Chris, he says something's going on in his life, I don't care how good it is. How minute it may seem. This is what I was saying the last time I, I, I was here. Your testimony means everything. Testify. You've got to have something good to testify in your life. There's got to be good things going on in your life. Things you want to brag about God on. Amen. I don't care how small it seems. Amen. Those little moments, man, you don't know what I'm going through. I need that. Amen. He said, God, God still loves me. God, you see, he loves you. Amen. And you. Amen. And you. Amen. And you by Facebook. Amen. God is so good. Especially in our suffering. Amen. Sometimes we get so caught up in our suffering. Why us? Why, why am I going through this? Why me? Why, why not you? What makes us any different than anybody else? Christ has been sent at all, suffered most. Right. Why am I not? Why am I excluding myself from suffering? How dare I? I should be like Paul, volunteer for more. Because through my sufferings, Brings his glory. Through my sufferings, hopefully one day I'll be a better pastor. Through my sufferings, hopefully I'll be a better friend, a better parent. Amen. Hopefully I'll be a better family member. Hopefully I'll be a better person at work. Amen. Hopefully I'll just be better through my sufferings. Amen. As much as I hate the suffer, I need him. And I hate to admit it, but it's true. Because sometimes I need to get knocked back down. Sometimes I get so caught up, caught up in what I'm doing in my life and blah, 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 how great I am and how great in the world. Sometimes I need to get knocked down. It's good for me. It is. And I'm not saying that if you want anything to be anybody's going through or has went through that I won't empathize you and I won't sympathize you because there's a lot of things that happen to people they shouldn't go through. I gave you a story. I still went through that, but I did. And it was before I was saved. It made me hate people. But now I tell you what, since since Christ got a hold of my heart, I like people again, Amen. and I like people no matter who they are and what they're doing. But I love people. I get to love people, man. What a pleasure that is. And what a pleasure, no matter how messed up you are, what you've done to me. What a pleasure that is. Amen. I'm going to read now Hebrews four, um, one. It says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news, that God has prepared for this rest, has been announced to us, to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only, only we who believe can enter his rest. And as for others, God said, in my anger, I took, my, I took, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world, we know it is ready because of the place, because of the place in the scripture where it mentions on the seventh day, um, on the seventh day, God uh, rested from all his work. But in all the other passages said they will never enter into my place of rest. Seventh day, God wasn't like tired. He didn't need to sit down and take a break. <laughs> He got to a place of rest so we could enter it with him. That's what he was desiring. He got to go the first six days, get to the seventh day. Well, so that's some suffering. So, so God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So God set another time for entering his rest. And then this, this time is today. God announced through David, much later in the words um, already quoted, today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now Joshua was seen giving him that rest. God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there's a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all um, who have entered the rest have rested from their labors, just as God did on the creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disagree today, God, as the people who entered it, we will fall. <coughs> Excuse me. For the word of God is alive and powerful. Is sharper than um, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He 
is the one who we are accountable. Nothing is, nothing is, nothing is sacred that, that you can hide. It, it's, it's all there. God knows all about it. And as it said in that psalm, I think it was 139, that you know my innermost thoughts. You know it all. You know them all. There's no reason for me to hide from you. You know, when David got to a place where he finally realized, and I'm in this place myself, it don't matter what I think and what I feel. Because God knows. So when I just talk about it, you know, when people call these prayers, like you got this whole big, huge Roman thing where you're, you know, everything's not so proper. It's not like that, man. God just wants to hear from you. Amen. He already knows your thoughts. Why don't you share it with him? Amen. He's the one that can change everything. He knows when you're suffering. He knows when you're acting like a brat. Be a brat. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you throw a fit. It doesn't matter if you question him. That doesn't matter either. He'll still love you. Right. And sometimes he'll give you the answers. And sometimes he won't. Right. You don't need him. You know, that's what I think the thing that, uh, that Paul was talking about when his affliction, you know, I got to take it away from me. No, you don't need me to. My grace is sufficient. Right? right. If, how can you get any grace if you don't suffer? How can you get any grace if, if you don't go through things? Like right now, man, I could drop dead. I'd be fine because I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. I'd be fine with that. I've been in borrowed time since 1992. That's how I look at it. So if I live another 40 years or another four minutes, it's all good. I count it good. I give God the glory. Amen. Amen. So I, I, I lost touch with my friend for, for many years that, that it happened. And that wasn't then. It was about a year or two later. And uh, I, finally got, I finally got a hold of him on that through course Facebook, you know, everybody's favorite uh, way to reunite with people to have. And uh, I went out and see him. And he's got a daughter in his room. Um, she's, his daughter's like, I think a year older than my son, and my son's 24. And he's got another son that, that lives with him still. And uh, he lives in Kalamazoo. And he's got this, you know, he's got his own house out there. And he's doing okay, you know, his parents are doing okay still, you know. And everything's, everything's in his life is pretty good. We're talking about the goodness of God. And, um, you know, he's not a super strong believer, but we started talking about stuff, and I'm like, you know, I'm a totally different human now, and he's so I know I can tell, blah, blah, blah. And, um, I said, just think, dude, if that night your car would have started, we would have none of this. None of this. You know, and, and, and I was crying like a baby when, um, and it's hard for me not to cry right now about this one, this whole thing I went through. Not because of the pain I went through, because of how could God, God's going to get me through it. Amen. What God's done for me now, I mean, I, in my work, I'm an electrician, I'm a, I'm a tech, um, an IT tech. Uh, I'm the vice president of the union there. I'm a, I'm a pastor here. I have another job. I, I've got great, great people in my lives. I, 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 my family loves me. They adore me. They adore me. My, my son, he, he's got cybers. I don't know. He's got, he's a great kid though. He's a great, great kid. I, didn't, I wouldn't have any of this. None of it. Amen. None of it. Amen. Because but, but, but God and his mercy back then and that brush. Because it's a miracle that happened then. Amen. 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 And, and, and this is the thing, like I didn't want to share this. And God's like, you need to share it. And I'm like, well, you are God. Okay. <laughs> but I think of too many times that we have stories like that. Of things that we went through that we don't share because we don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to think people think less of us. Sure. You know, we don't want to be humiliated. We don't want to go through the details of the, the things that we've done horrible. Because people look down on us, especially as pastors. Well, you know what? I mean, I'm not I'm not perfect. I'm a moron just like everybody else when it comes to making bad decisions. God's there, though. He's there for me. Amen. And he loves me. Amen. I'm gonna read a couple more scriptures and then uh I'll let Pastor Chris come up here and do what he does. <laughs> Psalms 139, 16. He says, You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Everyone was laid out before a single day has passed. God knew. God knew. He's using everything that's ever happened for your, for his glory and for your good. Job 31, 15, it says, For God created us both. I'm sorry, for God created both me and my servants. He created us both in the womb. Um, I didn't write down this last this last verse. I'm sorry. It's in the Bible, though, I promise. It says, all praise to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. 
because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us. Oh, it's Ephesians 4. Sorry, I just remembered. God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So no matter what you've done, you are still seen holy in the eyes of the Father, in the eyes of God, because he's adopted us, because we've asked forgiveness and accepted him as our Savior. And if you haven't done that, do that now by Facebook. If you need God, he's there. I don't care what you went through. I guarantee I went through some things. I went through little things about being shy, being stabbed. I've never told anybody. I've been through things with beatings I've never told anybody about. I've been through some stuff. And God's still here. He's so powerful. He's still in me. He can be in that. He's in you. He can do money and great things in your life. I'm a pastor now. Who would have thought? I never wanted to be a pastor. I didn't even believe God was existed. As a matter of fact, if he did exist, then I hated him. Because of what he did to me. I didn't deserve it. I was wrong. I was wrong. And right now, I'm not... And this may seem kind of crazy to you, but pastor slash officer Woldy, back in 1992, that happened. And I'm sure I did things to upset and scare you. And if I did, I apologize. And I want to, I want your forgiveness. And I forgive you as well. Because God is powerful in our lives. And I'm sure he's used you in mighty ways. And I hope he has since that happened to me before in your, in your pastoral stuff. And I praise God for all he's done in my life, too. And I'm glad, glad you were part of that experience to help me be who I am. Amen. Pastor Chris, you want to come up? And they say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some.
there's someone here, maybe not here, maybe you're in this sanctuary and watching us today. And uh, you, you're listening to Pastor Joel and you were saying, he's talking right to me. He's talking right to me. And, uh, I knew felt like in my heart that maybe there were some people that, as you were watching this, the Lord was ministering to you because you've been angry wondering why you're going through what you're going through and at the same time Amen. you were being told that God is with you Amen. and I felt that God was really speaking to some people, I told Pastor Joe guys, I just feel God's really Amen. and I want you to know that uh, if you are feeling that it's not a coincidence that you're joining us today, sure you may have came and you know you tuned in to us but the Holy Spirit prompted you to be with us this morning and he wanted you to know that he loves you. Amen. And that he cares for you. Yes. And that he sees what you're going through. And that he's going to bring you through it. And just like Job, you might not see it where you're at now. But just like Job, in time, God's going to use it yes. to bring glory and honor to his name. And you're going to look at that situation and say, well, I don't know how I got through that, but it, God got me through that. Amen. If you trust in him. If you reach out to him like Pastor Joe did, see, that's the that's the thing that you have to know that you got to do. Is you got to say, God, I'm going to turn this over to you. Right now, I don't see how anything good is going to come out of this. So I'm just going to ask you, those who are joining us, maybe here in the sanctuary, if you just close your eyes and just talk, talk to the Lord if you want to repeat after me or in your own way, I just want to help us to pray this morning and reach out to the Lord and say, Dear Father God, I ask you today to help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to realize that I need you. Yes. That I'm broken. I'm angry. I'm upset. I don't understand the things I'm going through. Yes. I'm frustrated. I've even said like Pastor Joe, it's not fair. I don't deserve this. But Lord, for whatever reason, the Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. And if I got to go through this, Lord, or whatever I'm going through, I know that if I call on you right now, in Jesus' name, and ask you to help me. And so I'm asking, Father, right now, that you would reach out and touch those that are hurting and struggling and going through depression, going through rejection, maybe going through worry and anxiety and stress. They don't even know why. I feel that in my heart. There's people that are going through stress and anxiety and they have symptoms going on in their physical bodies. They don't even know why. But right now, Lord, may they just trust you. Yes. May they reach out to you. Yes. May you heal them and touch them. Yes. Lift them out of this despair. Lift them out of this bondage. and Lift them out of this feeling of that they're no good and that they'll never be able to have a life like anyone else. Yes. That God, you can bless them like Joe. You can turn those things around, Lord. They, they're a diamond in the rough, Lord. Yes. And that God, you can bring them out and be glorified in their lives. Lord, so many were sitting here, I know, listening today, saying, that's me, that's me. We all have one thing to say to you today is thank you, Jesus. For loving us, forgiving us. Yes. And we ask you today to come into our hearts, cleanse us, wash us. Lord, we repent of anything that's not of you, Lord. Yes. We ask you to forgive us today. And we accept you into our hearts. Lord, let faith arise. Let hope arise. Yes. Let expectation arise. Yes. Let something come inside of us that says, there's got to be a better time for me. Thank you for that timely word. Thank you for Pastor Joe. Thank you for all those that are here watching us, those that joined us this morning. We ask your richest blessings upon all of them. Our church family, our pastor, Pastor Ron, Lord, Father, his wife, Lord, Sister Claudia, and Sherman, as they travel on the highways today, give them safe travel and mercies, Lord. Yes. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for Caleb, Lord, to share this worship today. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Just blessing them. And Clayton and Daniel, Lord, and others that were here that helped today. Bless them, God. Let them know that, Lord, they're not here for any other reason because you've drawn them here. Like that song that Caleb sang, Lord, from
Father, you draw them here with that desire. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. We love you today. Thank you for being with us today. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I enjoyed Pastor Joe's testimony and just what he shared. I, you know, um, Pastor Ron's been gone for a few weeks, and uh, because of that, we haven't had the, because of the, the bad weather and a few other things, but we haven't been having Wednesday night service, um, and we started that uh, not too long ago, and I believe we're going to get back on track with that starting uh, this week at 6.30, so we'd love to have you come and join us on Wednesday night. It's a little Bible study and some worship, and um, I've been I've had people asking me this week, and then you kind of alluded on it a little bit, so I'm going to try to clarify this, and maybe Caleb can put a little more details on but I've been having people ask me, what is Family Jam? Fam Jam. It's on our Facebook page. Caleb talked about it a little bit. He said it's their family getting together. But what I'm going to ask you is where, when, and is so, it on Facebook? Where family Jam, we were all talking at Joey's birthday party that, uh, that we're all going to get together on the 13th of March. Who's we are? Okay, so us and the Hill family. So all the rabies, so me, Daniel, Clayton, Joey, Joe, my dad. Kathy, Marty, Angie, uh, Jennifer Hill. Um, okay. We're gonna get, just we're gonna come up here. We're gonna play some songs here. That we love. We're gonna be here. Here. The thirteenth at five o'clock. I think five o'clock. I'll have to relook at that, but I'm pretty sure it's five five thirty. And so we'll it'll be on Saturday evening. So Saturday evening, March thirteenth. Yep, it'll be Facebook Live, and I'm sure if you want to come, I'm not gonna say the church is gonna be packed, but it could very well be packed. So um, keep that in mind as you. Whatever you would like to do, if you want to stay socially distanced, I would advise you to probably stay on Facebook Live. So. Well, we do have face masks, and uh, we do try to practice that, and we want to respect that with everybody. But So that's Family Jam. It's going to be here March 13th at 5 o'clock at Woodhaven Worship Center, a time of just singing and worship and testimony uh, so, by the, the rainy bunch. <laughs> and, uh, and the Hell family, and maybe a few others that might join in with them. That's extended family, right? Amen. So come to be a time of blessing, encouragement, and uh, we don't want it just to be. I know they don't want to be just a time of singing. They want to be a time of glorifying God and drawing us closer. And it will be on Facebook. So Sister Lois, you'll be able to watch it, um, and, and Sister Gloria and others. March 13th, we're going to put it on our Woodhaven Worship Center page and kind of be a little bit more descriptive with that. So again, uh, plan, make plans with that. Um, again, I'm going to just say thank you for being here today and joining us. I think Caleb's going to close in the song. And we love you. Have a great week in the Lord. And uh, keep your eyes on Jesus. You never know he might come this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Amen.